first of all, it's nice to see everyone. Thank you for, uh, for joining us once again. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fun group. We've, we've enjoyed it. Um, I, and I think that um, the thing is, as my email said, uh, boy, has AI been in, the, in particularly in the news. I mean, it, it has been for the past year, but to, as I, you know, on the day I was writing the email about today's, uh, today's meeting to have the top three headlines on the New York Times uh, uh, website uh, be, you know, ego, fear, and money, how the AI fuse was lit, who's behind the dawn of modern official art, artificial intelligence move, movement, et cetera. And then to have Maureen Dowd writing her column on Sam Altman. I don't know whether anyone uh, uh, looked at the at Maureen Dowd's column after that, but you know she, she started it and then I'm gonna move into our program. My favorite Twilight Zone episode is the one where aliens land and in a sign of their peaceful intentions give wor world leaders a book. Government cryptographers work to translate the alien language. They decipher the title to serve man. And that's reassuring, so interplanetary shuttles are set up. But as the cryptographers proceed, they realize too late that it's a cookbook to serve <laughs> man. <laughs> that, dear reader, is that's the story <laughs> of OpenAI. It was founded in 2015 as a not nonprofit to serve man to keep an eye on galloping AI technology and ensure there were guardrails and kill switches. Because when AI hits puberty, it will be like aliens landing. And I, and I think oh, the man. aliens have landed. <laughs> so so welcome, welcome to uh, AI in puberty. And with that, I think I'll, I'll hand it off to Stacy to, uh, to, to tell us how much trouble we're in or how or what a wonderful opportunity we've got. Welcome everybody. Has anybody played with these tools? No. Uh, no. Yeah. No. Yes. no. <laughs> a little bit. Yes. Who said we, yes? We had, we had one time? yes. Where was the yes? Kim. Kim. Okay. Well, that makes oh, sense. Oh, Kim? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, and Sher Sherry, yeah, Sherry and I have been playing around with this as well. Well, so the image, the image here on in this is actually generated by AI, um, and we'll talk about how that works. The agenda for today is to to kind of talk through these like three points, which is an introduction to generative AI and large language models, which go by the abbreviation LLM. I thought it would be fun if we just played around with some of these programs a little bit. And then we can like wrap by having a discussion both about how these tools are being used in education broadly and then specifically at Hudson Lab School and maybe implications. There's this like, you know, huge divide and huge anxiety and and excitement and like you know the the uh, 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 Scott I like that marine Dowd uh, column because it does talk about both the like promise and the fear in embedded in this but so you kind of see big shifts in in camps ranging from like chat GPT a threat to higher education or a threat to education overall or that, that this is actually going to usher in a golden era of education as we can do everything more effectively and faster and everyone can get a personal tutor. And so we'll we'll talk about, you know, those kind of things and maybe people can decide for themselves, like when we get there, what, like which direction it goes in. But starting off on like an introduction to generative AI and large language models, AI has actually been around for a long time. A lot of people cite, uh, like in the fifties, uh, with some of the as some of the like computer models began to be created, or the big computers began to create it. Uh, computer scientists start to the started to theorize around the concepts of uh, artificial intelligence and using 
computers using mathematical algorithms to begin to simulate um, uh, like what we would call intelligence or simulate decision making or those kind of things. Um, there have been a, a number of kind of boom and bust cycles in AI uh, with, you know, people getting excited. Maybe this crowd remembers, do people remember uh, uh, Kasparov being beat by IBM's yes. Deep Blue I in the chess match? Yes. Right? So like that was a big moment in like the, the 90s where it was like, oh, computers are beginning to catch up and there's enough processing power, there's enough computing power that a computer could think, you know, through all the permutations in chess and and start to begin to beat, um, uh, uh, you know, the best human players. And so that was like, that was a big moment. There's another moment like that um, when uh, Google's uh, AlphaGo beat um, the world's top Go player. If people know the 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 game Go, which is even more complex than chess and has more permutations. Um, but so like a lot of times it's been, these have been the kind of moments. And then I'd say over the past decade, there came to be this kind of general acceptance that that like AI, was they kind of call it AI and machine learning, ML, which is that you would turn a lot of computing power and algorithms towards like solving repeatable tasks. And it was sort of like, you could think of it as like giant mathematical calculations moving really fast and like lots of simulations. And then about a year ago, at the same time, and and as as Scott mentioned, in, in 2015, OpenAI was founded and started looking at kind of a different set of applied, basically a different set of models for artificial intelligence. And these were called like LLMs, so, so large language models and neural networks. And so they're they're actually like approximating the way that the kind of like brain functions and training the model on billions of data points. When we talk about that's like the super fast like speed through of you know artificial intelligence history. But a year ago, when Chat GPT was kind of announced to the public, it kind of hit the public consciousness, and people started getting super excited about this concept of generative AI. And what makes it different is that the current set of these these generative AI tools they take all that historical data and are creating new content. I was talking with the students in lab school last week about this, and I asked them if they knew about generative AI, and they said, oh, well, if you ask it a question, it goes out and searches the web and comes back and tells you the answer. And their kind of conceptualization of it was like a web browser. But that's not actually what's going on. Different tools may be connected to the web or not, but they're not searching the web for the answer. They are taking all that like data that they've got, that they've been trained on, and making a prediction about the set of things that it, we will talk about. So it's always new content, which of course leads to lots of arguments about intellectual property and ethics and the training models and all these kind of things. And this is a super complex space. And so even at Hudson Lab School, as we're looking at these tools and uh, trying to interpret work for education, we always take it through our lens of wanting to support our students as being good digital citizens. And that means, you know, with, with kind of deep ethics about what that means and about how to understand the tools and the biases implicit in them. But a key thing to know is like, this is new content, right? So and and just an example of like one of the kind of divides on this, there are a number of authors, Stephen King, Sarah Silverman, like, so Sarah Silverman's a comedian, she's suing OpenAI because she's saying, you've trained your models on my content. And so it's plagiarizing my content, I should get paid for that. Now, some people would say that's correct. There are other people that would say, well, it's not repeating your content. It's no different than Sarah Silverman herself has sat in many, many comedy clubs and read funny books and crafted her material based on learning about the, you know, learning about humor. 
and how to deliver a joke. And that it's almost impossible to take away from her experience. When she tells a joke, she's, you know, using all of that experience. And so how is this new thing that the computer has created any different from what you're doing? Because they're both processing all this history of information and coming up with something new. So I'm not weighing in on that debate, just saying like some of the debates that are out there. So Again, generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence that uses this machine learning algorithm and statistical probabilities to create new and original content like images, videos, text, and audio. The way that it works is that the computer scientists train the model on a set of information that could be images, it could be text. Uh, there's actually a good article and we will send around a set of resources, uh, but I'll show you this for a second. There's a good, art, there, there are a bunch of good articles on this. One of them is on the New York Times and it, and it will show, um, if I can do this, uh, there we go. It shows the kind of like process of a little large language model, an LLM or like a mini chat GPT learning how to talk. And so if you input the complete works of Jane Austen, uh, into it, it begins to train itself and like figure out like, you know, what all this language means. And so you can see that it's, it starts. But then after 250 rounds of training, it's beginning to understand English like letters. Huh. And after 500 rounds of training, so it's continuing to read and process and understand Jane Austen, it starts improving its guesses and beginning to like learn words and talk about words, but still mostly gibberish. At 5,000 rounds, bigger words, wow. right? So it's begun to put together sentences, but they're like not, they don't make very much sense, but it's beginning to be much more like Jane Austen. And so after 30,000 rounds of training, awesome. it's actually able to speak in full sentences and, and you can see in here that it took an hour so far for the 30,000 rounds of training. So the sentences make sense. Um, and eventually it begins to, and it will get to this point where it can replicate and you can like prompt it to rewrite things in Jane Austen's kind of voice. And like, that's the process that all of these things are going through. Chat PT itself, the, the most famous of these, not least because of the Altman sagas over the last few weeks, was trained on everything on the internet before 2021. So it 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 interpreted the, the internet for a long period of time. Now, this uses huge amounts of computing power and huge amounts of, of like processing power, right? I, you know, those kind of things, like, it, like huge amounts of data, huge amounts of processing power to be able to do that. And it's very expensive. We can talk about those implications. It also has really interesting implications be, that the data set really, really matters. So for example, if you ask chat GPT math problems that are around five ninths and adding 32, it's very good at math problems that have that calculation embedded in it because that's the calculation for changing Fahrenheit to Celsius and Celsius to Fahrenheit. And so like that's repeated in lots of places on the internet. But if you ask it to do math problems that say are like around seven fifths X and adding 17, it's not as good at those. Like oh. it, because there's less examples that it has to draw on. The, you know, there's lots of difference of these types of models. There are tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of these models kicking around. So chat GPT is you input text and the output is text. Midjourney is an example of like an image processor. So the input is text and the output is an image. There's one called Codex where you put in text and it writes computer codes. You're like, I'd like my web page to be this and it will write you the code for your web page to be that. There's some examples we'll go through these. Music LM where the input is text and the output is music. I'm gonna show you one of these in a second. There's one called Sing Song where the input is the song and it creates the background music for you. Yeah, or yeah. there are examples like Runway, where the input is text and the output is video. And we'll look at all of those. Um, here are some static versions. We're going to play with these. But like I wrote this in 
just for fun to think about how we could create descriptions for next year's summer camp. And I said, write me a description of a camp about a Hogwarts Express escape room. And it, in seconds, generates this whole paragraph. Welcome to the Hogwarts Escape Room Camp as we transport you to the world of Harry Potter and challenge you to escape from the Hogwarts Express. This is an example of Mid Journey, and this is a friend of ours and a friend of the school named Francesca Rosella, who's big in this space and big in the fashion technology space. And she's been using generative models to design clothing and design fashion. And so this prompt on the right, a rainy day in London, in a dark and mysterious futuristic London, the streets were empty and quiet, and you can continue to read, generated this image here, wow. right? Like she wrote this, and this is the way the computer interpreted that image. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So again, chat GPT, you put input is like, write a limerick about data taking over the world, including the word egg, you know? And so the output is text. Um, data taking over the world, it's true, is growing like an egg that's due. It's everywhere we go, it's taking over slow, but in the future, there's nothing we can do. Little more of the Maureen Dowd kind of approach there. <laughs> Mid journey is an image one. So you put a rabbit wearing a sun hat or Santa Claus in a blue outfit or a watercolor of a red bicycle in front of a waterfall. And these are the outputs that it creates. Mm. All right. So we're going to look at one now. We're going to play, we're going to look at a few of these different different things and then we'll start playing with them ourselves. But this is a new model from Google uh, in the music space. So check it out. Artists are always looking for new ways to get inspired, new ways to create great music and share their work, new ways for their songs to connect with people. Technology is and has always been a close collaborator in this. Now AI tools are opening up a new playground for creativity. We're experimenting with new ways to let artists, songwriters, and producers instantly hear their ideas. New ways to use technology to help them create music. Like singing a melody to create a horn section. Also starting to bring these possibilities to creators and fans with a new experiment called Dream Track. Just type in your idea and get a unique soundtrack for your short. Baby, we've got nothing in common, but I know that I'm what you've been wanting for so long now. The potential. All right, so did everyone catch that? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah is that sufficiently insane for everybody <laughs> the, the guy in that 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 clip the first the first part of that sang a melody into his microphone ba -da -ba -ba -ba, and then typed in the style of a saxophone and it changed it to a sax right and then created all those you know other tracks for it and then later in that video Someone has said, I'd like a ballad about, you, you know, missing my loved one or whatever in the style of this artist. And it created that, you know, it creates all, basically creates that ballad on, on the fly. Interestingly, this is Google, which, so this is the, like the, this is the, um, you saw it was deep, deep mind. It, it's the thing. It's like the AI that was built off the many years of the thing that, uh, of, uh, beat the 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 player in in uh, uh in the game of go so like they've continued to build on that stack how much is this um, google program i think they're offering it free right now to to users and and trialing it a lot of the programs are actually very affordable five dollars a month type subscriptions for low level usage it's when you want to do really, when you want to do a lot more, it can get expensive quickly, but a lot of them are fighting for adoption. They want to become the platform that people use. And so they're making the tools available for people at like very affordable prices. 
All right, let's go to some more examples. All right, does everyone know, do people know David Attenborough? Yes, of course. All right, you'll like this next clip then. So what's going on in this clip is a computer scientist has attached a image recognition software to chat GPT so that chat GPT interprets whatever it sees on his webcam. And then he's also trained a version of chat GPT and a, and a like vocalizer to imitate the style and vocal range of David Attenborough. So you can see what happens. Here's a quick demo of what happens when David Attenborough narrates your life. On the left, I'm gonna start my camera, which every five seconds uh, takes a photo from my webcam. On the right, I'm going to start David Attenborough. And now, as I move around, he... Here we have a remarkable specimen of Homo sapiens, distinguished by his silver circular spectacles and a mane of tousled curly locks. He is wearing what appears to be a blue fabric covering, which can only be assumed to be part of his mating display. Look closely at the subtle arch of his eyebrow. It's as if he's in the midst of an intricate ritual of curiosity or skepticism. The backdrop suggests a sheltered habitat, possibly a communal feeding area or watering hole. <laughs> so again, what's amazing about that is that it's it's interpreting what he's doing and the scene around him, and then immediately translating that into a a style. Now, as you can imagine, David Attenborough was not happy about this, right? And and this really brings up the the huge issues in again intellectual property likeness, all these things. They are really big complex issues. Uh, but I like these examples because they're just so wild in terms of what the the technology can do. So I'm going to show one more, and then and then we're we're going to play ourselves on this. This is a program called Runway. It allows you to type in a piece of text and it outputs a video. Okay, so jumping straight into Runway ML and I'm already logged in and I'm using Gen2, I'm gonna go ahead and press start with image. And this opens up the familiar interface which now has more controls along the bottom. Well, so he's actually, he's gonna drop in an image here. You can show some of the examples or in, in other ones. You literally type a person walking through the forest and it will generate a video of that. Gonna go ahead and press upload a file and I've got various still images that I've generated using Midjourney. So we have a camper van, princess, a origami paper scene, this creepy character made out of wires, cartoon spider, this Tim Burton inspired character, a little gnome guy, a princess ninja. So I'm just gonna quickly and crudely paint round a young Wookiee. You then have sliders for horizontal, vertical, and proximity movement. So if you want your character to move to the... So what he's doing is he's dropped in these images and now he's saying what in the image he wants to make move and turn into video. Left or to the right, move up or down, and closer or further away from the camera. And that's... And a very cool scene with yeah, the camera zooming out. So you can see like out. the camera motion the on that. Is slightly moving up in frame and to the left but it feels like more. And you can see even in the background, there's someone like at the bar that it's animated. All right, so here's some more examples of this. And a few camera controls just to share some output um, and just try things out. And I'll put on some music. Enjoy. So I don't know if that's sufficiently insane for everybody. I just go crazy about it because he's dropping in images 
And again, he created those images using text in mid journey. Right, right. And then he's dropping them in there. And by highlighting a little piece of it, it's creating video. The ability to do that is just so wild. Okay, so we get a sense of like, uh, you know, all right, well, this can be used in literature and creative industries and things like that. These tools are also super, super powerful in all sorts of different settings. And, and so one of the things that I want to point out are cool things like uh, the, the, uh, a bunch of the U.S. government, like scientific uh, groups, have come together to create this Aurora supercomputer for science, and it uses these generative AI models to. They're training it on all this scientific data in all the U.S. government databases and everything, and all the universities. And so now, uh, it's already shown um, to be speeding up the pace of innovation and discovery in the sciences by five times yes. the pace of what had been done before, if not more than that. And a great example of this, there was an article in the Times a couple of days ago about how they've used the Aurora models to discover hundreds or several thousand new materials just be by recombinating like different types of chemical and, and, and atoms and have designed all these different kind of potential new advanced materials that again we hadn't thought of before and that we just hadn't had the processing power to go and compute all right i'll pause again for questions while i tee up the next section here uh in the last school year the third grade i wasn't it the third grade was doing a, a project on on food commercial film director who i worked with years ago uh we the third grade went over to his studio and they filmed a TV show with him, uh, to, and which was great. And afterwards, I was talking with him, and he, who has, he, he has a great studio where he can shoot food. They have a full kitchen and everything. But of course, he, you know, he, he wanted to show some of his clients some sample commercials that included full backgrounds for the food photography, which had also always been totally impractical for him to, the best he could do to show what he felt would be a good commercial for their product would be to draw a storyboard. He used Runway, the, the program that Stacy was just saying, to generate backgrounds for his food photography. And he showed me a commercial that he had put together for Jack in the Box as an example of, of what he thought a, a new campaign might be for them. He was able to shoot all the food photography live, tabletop in his studio, and then he completely generated a motion background for it. And, and he, as he said at the time, it just blows me away. This is stuff that I that I you know I've been doing this for 30 years. Discord, and I've never been able to do anything like this. It was pretty cool. Yeah. All right. Qu questions, thoughts? I can just see why there's so many ethical uh, questions and, you know, the whole thing with the strike with the, all the actors and so on and so forth and how the fear is there of AI taking some of their jobs away and so on. And I, as a, I'm a music uh, musician, I'm a composer. I know there's an art teacher here. Um, I, I can just see all that. Yeah, I can just see all that. Uh, that's huge. That's huge. Yeah, it's really wild. Um, all right, let's play a little bit. So this is Dolly 3. Mm -hmm. So this is an image platform that is in chat GPT. It's one of the image versions. So what we want to create an image of. I was looking at the logo for the school and I see you don't have the river in there. So can we create a logo uh, with the Hudson Lab School with, with trees and a river? And the Palisades, maybe. I don't know. There we go. So I'm giving it the prompt. Okay. Let me see it. Yeah. Uh-oh. There's no path. Oh. No, it's working. It's working. It's creating the image. So what's really interesting as it's doing this is the output that we get is only as good as the input. So you might've heard about this concept. What we just wrote is a prompt. 
And so one of the big jobs they think that is going to be exist in the future is called a prompt engineer, which is as you begin to play with these tools, Ooh, I like you it. have to learn how to give it better and better prompts. Oh my wow, gosh. That's good. Can right? you believe it? Put it, put the the it, it, it put the bridge in. Right. It figured out Palisades and and like the, the George Washington or the Tappan Zee Bridge or like, yeah. you know. But it spelled school wrong. Yes, it Hudson did. Hudson Skull. <laughs> right, it did, yeah. Hudson Not also was wrong. Yeah. So the engineer would be like someone who would come up with the keywords, the right words to use to create what you want. Yes. That's right. And then to take it up another level is you go back to chat GPT and you say, I'm a graphic designer at a project-based independent uh, uh, school called Hudson Lab School. Um, can you help me write a prompt uh, to create some new logos in Dolly E3 uh, that incorporate the school's name, the river, the Palisades, and anything else, Leslie? Uh, trees. And yeah, and trees. And nature. So you can you do this thing that like you can actually use Chat GPT to begin to create a better prompt and you can like learn it that way. In fact, they've found that when you ask Chat GPT to wait a minute and think about it's like to do a cycle itself before answering you, it actually gives you better outputs. All right. So now we're going to prompt Dolly 3, the prompt that Chat GPT gave us, and we'll see what it does differently. Look at that prompt. It's so beautifully written. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. it's, it's amazing. And I put in, you can see, so chat GPT in the paid version, this is chat GPT four. There you go. Ooh. Oh, wow. Hudson oh lab -ba 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 <laughs> and the Houston lab. Spelling problems. Still having real yes. issues with spelling. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating. I and so that. a good prompt engineer will continue to work with it. When we talked, we showed that one that Francesca's, you know, using it to create fashion. She sometimes spends two hours crafting the specific image that she's working on. So Chat GPT has started opening this up to, pe to people to write little new chat bots. And so you can see these are some that people have been writing. Game time. I can quickly explain board games or card games to players of any age. Let the games begin. Or the negotiator, I'll help you advocate for yourself and get better outcomes, get to become a great negotiator. Um, data analysis, there's one called like coloring book hero, which is always fun. Create a coloring book page of the grandparents council meet, oops, <laughs> Zoom meeting uh, for Hudson Lab School. <laughs> yeah. We'll see what it comes up with, but there's lots and lots of different like potential applications here and people are like building all sorts of different things on these models to allow for different uses and outputs there you go <laughs> grandparents <laughs> zoom me -oting. it really has problems with with spelling doesn't it oh it does um, terrible which is super fascinating but it's a pretty cool little uh oh, it's so sweet with all the little pets underneath oh yeah oh. all right let's talk about what we're doing at school, and then we can decide how much over we're gonna go. So obviously these are powerful, powerful tools and the state of the art is like really, really changing. Um, when they originally came out and you can see, you see this, there's some institutions that are like, oh no, like this is horrible. Kids, they don't need to learn to read or write anymore because they're just gonna have chat GPT do their homework. In New York City, the initial response was to ban these tools in the classroom. So there are specific tutors that are being created, AI like bots for tutoring. I'm actually working with an entrepreneur 
who's building, who has been a teacher and a math tutor for a long time and is building a math tutor on this. This was just an example that I was working on with Scarlett, my daughter, the other day in that she had a math problem. And so we put the math problem in here and then we asked it to like help us figure out the steps about how to solve it. And that was really helpful for her to like begin to understand here are the different like ways to go through this and then here are the different equations and then walk it through. And then we did a number of other like models to do that. Um, as I mentioned, there are lots of AI tutors being developed around the world. So uh, people may have heard of Khan Academy, an online math program for the past decade. They've now built Khan Migo, which is their version of a tutor for math. In other places, like a, a school called Redbridge, which is one of the schools in the Innovative Schools Cooperative that we are part of, we're one of the founding members, and Orly Friedman is the founder of this school. And Orly and her team, like they're building lessons around this. They talk about how at a project-based school, their kind of unit was uh, how can they use chat GPT in the classroom and what are the like, what is it good for? What are the downsides? So they worked with students who were ages eight to 10, writing at a fourth grade level. And then it lays out what they went through. And so we'll share this out so that everyone can kind of read about you know, how schools are beginning to incorporate this kind of stuff. But at, at Hudson Lab School, well, so it currently is getting used in, in middle school projects. The students have used it in different ways. One student last year in the Shakespeare unit used Mid Journey to create her interpretation of the characters in uh, Midsummer's Night's Dream and to like craft those. And then she turned, used those like art objects and images that she created to build a board game that she built around the mid mid uh, summer's night's dream kind of concept. Oh. <laughs> we currently have a couple eighth graders who are doing their capstone projects uh, based on this. So so using different AI tools um, to and and building around there. So there'll be more information on that. Um, we've been experimenting in art class around it, and we've also been working with our teachers to understand how it can build their practice. Because not only is it a powerful tool for the students themselves, but it can make the teacher's work easier, faster. They're able to build you know, their practice using these tools as well. And to give a concrete example of like uh, you know, some of the things that we're doing. So last week we had an AI art class where we're focusing on how do we build better prompts. Again, it's all about writing the right types of prompts and giving the computers the right information to create the output they want. So we took this still life. This is a picture. This is a, a, a photo of the middle school classroom and with all these kind of plants in here. And then uh, I was working with the students to understand ChatGPT and Dolly 3 and MidJourney. So we got them like working on and understanding like how to use the programs. And then they were challenged to write prompts to oh. begin to like create that. And so these are some of the versions that got created on their prompts. And this was the winning one. This is Jamie Centeno's, uh, like, uh, like we had a little contest and this was what she was able to create. And this was the prompt that she ended up writing that created that you can kind of see like it's not perfect but she did a pretty good job of yeah. capturing that scene she sure did right uh and so we've been playing around and beginning to just kind of learn these tools we're really really at the beginning of all this for society for certainly at hudson lab school going back to our woods to wired kind of motto connected to the planet prepared for the future it's super important for us at hudson lab school to have the students understanding and knowing and learning how to use these technologies uh, so that they can be you know, in charge of their learning journeys and have strong outcomes of this. And so we definitely are working, we're an institution that's working on ways to bring these technologies into the classroom while at the same time creating the right guidelines for the students and staffs to, to be able to use them. One of our core tenants is building digital citizenry, right, which is building People who care about the community, care about the planet, care about each other, are digital citizens, know they're part of a community. But but on the digital side, like know how technology impacts society, impacts community, impacts their lives. And so that they know how to use these types of tools and all technology with care. We think it's important 
for Hudson Lab School graduates to develop critical AI literacy, right? People may say it's really early. They can do this in high school or in college. The reality is these tools are coming now. Having fluency with them and understanding when to use them and how to use them and what's right and what's not, and how to how we as a, a education community can use them to help our learners is super important. And we're super focused on adopting ethical AI practices for education. If anybody needs to leave, please, you, you cannot offend us. We understand. We're going to take another 10 minutes. I have to, however, commend you. You have just had us experience experiential learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> just, uh, Kim, I don't know if you had any additional thoughts on just like how this has been playing out in our approach to it. And then and then we can wrap and we will share this these materials out and I love this stuff. So anyone who wants to keep playing or wants, you, you know, we can do another like session where we get people on computers and playing with it on their own, whatever we want to do. I think Stacy's kind of impressed upon you that we are leaning in. We had an interesting faculty meeting the first week that OpenAI was released. And you could just see the teachers shoulders going up, especially the writing teachers. And they were just like, whoa, no. <laughs> And by the end of that meeting, we all kind of came to the realization that that's not who Hudson Lab is. Like, this is the way of the future and that, and we are the way of the future. So uh, we will be learning how to use it uh, appropriately, of course, at each grade level. And we'll learn, we'll figure out how to scaffold it from kindergarten to eighth grade. But in general, this is something that we're all going to be interacting with and probably already are, whether we know it or not. And so we're going to make sure that these kids are equipped to be able to, to use it to their advantage and use it to, uh, as a tool. I just want to thank you very much for trying to bring us along, bring me along, because indeed the kids do talk about this, as do peers, and I really appreciate you taking the time to try to help us get a glimmer of an understanding <laughs> and to get some tools of how we can learn about it. It makes us feel like we're becoming a little more educated, and my gosh, it's all over the times every day, so... Cheers. Thanks. Okay. Congratulations for bringing us to up to mm -hmm. on something, a topic that's so uh, timely. Thank you. How are you going to be able to detect whether a particular paper was done by AI or was actually was the work of the student? There are already tools that our middle school teachers use regularly. There was already a, a screener for plagiarism and every paper that we write, the, the teachers double check. And there's now a tool for AI. And, it, and if you really play with AI, you'll see it's still a little formulaic and it writes a little robotically. And so it can detect it. Um, and so we're already using some of those tools. Yeah, I, I mean, I think you, there, there will be the constant cat and mouse game of, of build a tool and to, to detect and like, can you write around it? I would say teachers who know their students well can also understand they, they just have a sense for, all right, this is their work. This is not their work. But you're right, at the higher education levels and, and in high school and things, that becomes more complicated. I think it, it will require a, a rethinking of assessment in some cases, right? You're going to have people have to handwrite exams to show that it is their work, or you have to change the nature of the exams to show that they're using the tools in a way that is like also demonstrating their knowledge or whatever the teacher wanted to get out of that course. And so I, I think you're going to see changes in the practice, changes in, in assessment, in some kinds, like interestingly, like moving from digital to like more analog types of assessment to, to, to try and combat those kind of things. I also think teachers are starting to understand that, especially the Khan Academy tool for teachers, that they can be like assistant, AI can be like an assistant teacher. So you can have, uh, you can input a piece of work that the student has written, and then you can ask AI to give you suggestions for how to improve it. So in that way, it's tutoring the child instead of just doing it for them, um, which then be, if you're using it well, then, then enhances them as a writer and, and strengthens their skills. So there are great ways to use it with teaching, not just trying to prevent it in teaching. Thank oh. you very much. and. Unfortunately, AI is running along, but we have to really think about the ethics of AI as, as and it happens all the time in every new concept. I was so impressed last year, the end of year capstone pro projects, there was one student who 
at that point uh, uh, realized that AI was here and that Hudson Lab School didn't have an ethics code around AI. So that was his project. We thank you, Stacy. Thank you, yes. Kim. This is great. It leaves me wanting more. Uh, send a e email me, email us questions. If you'd like to, to us to do to go further on this, maybe schedule another session, happy to do it. Or uh, <laughs> if you want references, resources, we'll try and help there. Kim? I would just add on, you can send us any ideas of anything that you want a next meeting to be about. The, um, this one, we could probably have many meetings about this one, but if there's mm -hmm. other things on your mind or other, you know, whether it's current events or what your grandkids are talking about or anything, we are welcome to all your ideas. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. The one uh, one last thought before we before we go, um, uh, that Christine Bullen, an, another member of our grandparents council, another grandparent in the school, uh, who couldn't be here today, sent a, a message. But Christine is an academic, and she was involved very very early on in the in the early AI discussions and, and uh, uh, generating the uh, you know, involvement. And she said there was a huge argument between the academics and the computer nerds and the, and the computer engineers about what to call it. And the academics wanted it to be called assisted intelligence. Ooh. And the computer nerds wanted it to be called artificial intelligence. And she said, I'm, we were so disappointed and we think it was such a, a, a mistake and a problem that, that it got called the very cool and futuristic and somewhat scary artificial intelligence. We feel like we would have been on a better path today if, if it had been called assisted intelligence. It wouldn't sound so ominous. That's, my, that's Christine's closing thought for the day. I wish she could express it herself and maybe we'll get a chance for her to do it or we could do it via an email exchange. Anyway, thank you everyone thank uh, you. For, for, for coming, for, for being a part of this. This has been a really interesting session. We'll see you uh, at our next meeting in the new year. Great. Thank, Thank you so everybody. much. Stay Bye. Everybody. Bye. Happy Bye. holidays. Yes. Happy holidays to you guys too.